So it's good to be back with you all. I've been here a couple times before and um, really appreciated uh, both times. So um, I'm calling in to you from the lands of the Muncie, Lenape and Merrick peoples of Long Island, New York. And uh, it's a, a very peaceful summer evening. Just took my dog for a walk. So just inviting us all to just arrive here with a few breaths in awareness. Noticing your body, remembering that you have a body. So easy to forget that important fact. And noticing that your body is breathing and that you're alive in this moment. Really letting yourself connect with your breath. And also noticing that you are being supported by whatever land that you are on. Something is holding your body up. And uh, Letting yourself feel the way in which those who have walked and lived on the land that you are currently in have been part of supporting you as well. Previous generations of settlers, of native people, indigenous people. They're all a part of you. And all the beings of the land that you are on. Four-legged and winged ones. Letting yourself feel that connection. How all, all of these beings are important. And allow your life to, to be. That was just about appreciating the land that we're on and all the beings that have made it possible for us to be here. So in many countries in Asia, in Buddhist temples, there's a common symbol of a wheel with eight spokes. And there's a hole in the center for the axle of the carriage. And I learned that this often represents the Dharma, the way uh, the Buddha put the wheel of the Dharma in motion. And there's these eight spokes that are representing the Noble Eightfold Path. 
But while I was living in Sri Lanka, I was offered another meaning of this symbol of this eight spoked wheel with a hole in the center. These are the eight worldly winds. They are four pairs of opposites, pleasure and pain, gain and loss, praise and blame, and fame and disrepute. So there are four things that we hope for on one side of the column and four things that we fear on the other side of the column. So the image of the wheel is helpful because the wheel is always turning and these eight worldly winds are always shifting. So they never stop blowing these winds and we can't get comfortable either with the joy of pleasure and gain nor do we need to identify with the misfortunes that come our way and think that they define our whole life. So if we get possessive of them, if we try to hold on to either, either of the categories, uh, we'll get rope burn because these experiences inevitably move on and we suffer if we think we can control them and only have gain and never have loss, only have pleasure and never have pain. So the wheel is gonna keep turning no matter what we do or how we live our lives. It doesn't mean that our choices don't matter or that ethical living is not important, but that even as we align ourselves with compassion and non-harming, We need to release the expectation that virtuous actions will always be rewarded or that the eight worldly winds will stop blowing and changing. So this teaching of these ever blowing, ever changing eight worldly winds can help us to face the fact that our lives are always in flux and we can move with that in a graceful way if we see that these winds they don't necessarily blow in response to our actions they're not necessarily deserved whether pleasant or painful oppression for instance injustice it's not justified it's not predestined when those with power oppress others, we need to resist this oppression and transform it, heal it. So the changing nature of life circumstances isn't an excuse to avoid actively responding to and disrupting social injustice. It's not an excuse to sidestep our responsibility to speak up. When we can do something to change things, we really need to. But sometimes there's nothing we can do to shift the situation, at least not immediately. So in both cases, whether we can change things or we can't, it brings spaciousness to remember that life is full of ups and downs as the beloved Cambodian monk Mahagosananda said, in response to being asked how he maintained his balance and optimism during the terror of the Khmer Rouge, he said, life is full of ups and downs. That's calmly facing the eight worldly winds, right? When we accept that this is life full of ups and downs, we're able to touch that we are more than our life's ups and downs. So there's a measure of freedom that's gained when we 
Simply accept that these winds are constantly blowing through our lives. So a teaching that is um, similar, that offers some, some echo of this is from Thich Nhat Hanh, my teacher. Uh, we call him Thai, which means teacher in Vietnamese. His students call him that. And he has offered six mantras of true love. So very powerful sentences we can say to our loved ones to, um, to help us really uh, practice deeply to keep our relationships beautiful and fresh and um, alive, living. So the first one, um, I'll tell you all of them, but I just really want to talk about the sixth mantra. But the first one is, my darling, I am here for you. They all start with my darling. You could always adapt it if you have other terms of endearment. So first one, my darling, I'm here for you. Second one, my darling, I know you are there and I am very happy. So these are ways to bring ourselves present to really see and take in the people we love. The third one, my darling, I know you suffer. That is why I'm here for you. Fourth one, my darling, I suffer and I need your help. So not getting caught in pride and saying, I'm not hurt, but admitting if we're hurt, we need, we need each other's help. And the fifth one, my darling, this is a happy moment. So that's not letting a time of beauty, of, of goodness, slip through our awareness, but stopping to recognize, hey, when we are sitting down to eat a, a good meal together, or when we're folding laundry, or when we're laughing about something, um, this is a happy moment. It's really taking it in and celebrating it and noticing it and honoring. This is good right here. Not letting uh, that slip through. And then the last mantra, which is the one I want to speak to, says, my darling, you are partly right. You are partly right. Okay, so I'll put these in the chat, these six mantras, and you can read um, more about them in Thai's book. At least the first four are explained very clearly in Thich Nhat Hanh's book, Learning um, uh, I think it's called True Love. It's a blue book with a heart on it. The last two he developed after that book, <laughs> but he explains the first four. Uh, so this sixth mantra, you are partly right. He said, you should practice this whenever someone praises you or blames you. So it's the same response in either case that um, this sentence has the wisdom of the eight worldly winds in it. Because we take in neither the praise nor the blame of anyone who gives it to us as the whole description of who we are. So when people appreciate us and affirm us, we know that they see some part of us, they see our strengths, but we also know that we have weaknesses, we have things that they might not see. So they're partly right. And we can take in the praise, we can let it nourish us, but we still know they are partly right. We, we keep our humility. And similarly, when others judge and blame us, they may see our shortcomings clearly, but we also know we have our beauty and goodness. So they're still just partly right. So practicing this mantra keeps us humble when we might fall into pride, but it also grounds us in confidence when we might fall into self-criticism. And it helps us remember that this wheel is always turning. One day you, you may get 
praised, one day you may get blamed, and they are just partly right. So what I really appreciate in this symbol of the wheel is that it has a hole in the middle. And that is the key. Because from the center of this wheel, we can see all the eight worldly winds blowing in and out of our lives without getting caught in them. And that center that's empty, there's nothing there. It's a reminder of our own emptiness, our own capacity to touch something deeper in us than the circumstances of our lives. So this gives us the ability to see ourselves as more than just the eight worldly winds that come our way. To in fact see ourselves and everyone and to see everyone and everything in us. Very deep practice. So Thomas Merton the Trappist monk, he speaks to this emptiness from the perspective of the contemplative Christian tradition. He says, at the center of our being is a point of nothingness that is untouched by sin and by illusion, a point of pure truth, a point or spark which belongs entirely to God which is inaccessible to the fantasies of our own mind or the brutalities of our own will. This little point of nothingness and of absolute poverty is the pure glory of God in us. It is like a pure diamond blazing with the invisible light of heaven. It is in everybody. And if we could see it, we would see these billions of points of light coming together in the face and blaze of a sun that would make all the darkness and cruelty of life vanish completely. I have no program for this seeing. It is only given, but the gate of heaven is everywhere. So the gate of heaven is not in praise or gain or fame or pleasure. If it's not also in blame and loss, and disrepute, and criticism, and pain. So if we over-identify with the eight worldly winds and we're dependent on others' praise or opinions about us to be happy, our happiness will be insecure and unreliable. But if we can see our lives from the standpoint of that empty center, that point of pure truth that Merton speaks to, we then have compassion for ourselves and the situations we encounter quite naturally. And when the way we see ourselves is based on our own compassion and love for ourselves, which allows us to be forgiving of our mistakes and confident in our own progress on our path, then our happiness is solid and reliable. So this non-reliance on external sources of approval and disapproval that float on the eight worldly winds brings us into our center, to the place of stillness and quiet that leads us to awareness of not-self. So not-self is a fundamental characteristic of existence in Buddhism, like impermanence. It is the emptiness that the whole of the wheel represents. Not self means we're empty of a separate self, but we're full of everything else. So it doesn't mean we don't exist. It just means we don't have a separate self that's existing independent from everything else. So we're full of everything else, meaning we're made up of all those who have influenced us and helped to shape us in some way. 
our parents, teachers, friends, all the food we've ever eaten, all the books we've read, all the music we've listened to, the sunlight, the water, the air that have made up our cells. So we cannot exist by ourselves alone. We can only exist because each of these elements has come to help up to help make up a part of who we are. So if we can understand and live from this insight, we will be incredibly empowered and we'll hold a kind of secret weapon when moving through times of adversity and change. With the insight of not self, we neither chase after pleasure or fame, nor fear pain and disrepute because we know we are larger than these forces and they can't define us. This non-fear is what gives people courage to make big sacrifices and take incredible risks, knowing we're acting on behalf of the whole and that our actions will still have an impact even if we and our small selves will not be there to see it. So the Brazilian theologian Hubem Alves says, we must live by the love of what we will never see. That's not self-talking, right? Not doing things because we'll get immediate gratification, but doing things because that's what we must do, whether we see the results in our lifetime or not. So another analogy that can help us with this connecting to this still center, this empty space in the center of the wheel is this uh, analogy of water and waves. So on one level, a a wave can be characterized as fast or slow, big or small, high or low. But if a wave is able to touch its true nature as water, it gets in touch with a part of itself that can't be characterized by up or down, coming or going, being born or dying. Water is beyond all of these conditions. And so this empty hole In the center of the wheel, it points us back to our true nature, not as a wave whipped about by the eight worldly winds, but rather as water itself, vast and imperturbable. When we touch our deeper reality as water, the insight of not self, we navigate transitions much more easily. We navigate difficulties much more smoothly. So we don't take things as personally and we're less afraid. So at the age of 88, my teacher Tai had a massive stroke and the physicians didn't expect him to pull through, but he did. One side of his body was paralyzed and he lost his speech. He became totally dependent on others to take care of him, all of his needs. So at first, I imagine it was quite difficult to adjust to this change. But I had a chance to visit him. a few years after this stroke, and he seemed very at peace with his situation. He was deeply present and very powerful spiritually. He was able to communicate through gestures. He was able to still teach through his presence rather than through his words. And I sense that he was able to move gracefully with the worldly winds of loss and pain, 
because he wasn't attached to this idea of a separate self who had to try to maintain control and keep it all together. He had practiced for so many years to see himself as his community, to see any of his students, anyone practicing his teachings was his continuation, was him. So when he lost his ability to teach, to walk, he could see his continuation. He was still there in his students as they walked, as they talked, as they did everything that they were doing that he taught them to do. When we touch our nature as water, as that hole in the wheel, we get a larger perspective. So we're not just these small selves in these limited circumstances. We're much, much more. So Tai wrote, to see one in all and all in one is to break through the great barrier which narrows one's perception of reality. So let's practice this in a um, meditation. And uh, we'll, we'll see how we can, can move with these eight worldly winds in a in a wise way. So I invite you to settle back into this moment, finding a posture that's supportive. You can visualize your upper body from the waist up, reaching up towards the sky like a tree. Growing a little taller, spreading. And then allow the lower part of your body to root down into the earth. Grounding yourself. So feel the aliveness in your body right in this moment as you ground yourself in the earth and grow upwards toward the sky. Now just allowing your whole body, your whole being to simply be and rest right in this place. Now let yourself just visualize this wheel, this wheel with eight spokes. Maybe if your eyes are open, it could be helpful to close them to get a picture in your mind. But only if that feels right. So put yourself in the center of this wheel. in that empty space where you can observe all of the eight worldly winds blowing in and out. Though the wheel turns and turns, the eye of the wheel 
is still. And that's where you are. You observe the circumstances of your life, the losses, the gains, the pleasure, the pain, but you begin to be free from attachment and aversion to these things. Feel what it's like to breathe deeply and let yourself rest in this still center. Jumping off the endless and exhausting hamster wheel for a time, trying to control the eight worldly winds. Just let yourself rest. Maybe if you had a moment that was pleasurable, something that you enjoyed recently, you could let that come to mind, some, something you gained or some praise that you received. And see if you can just see that as a cloud floating in the sky. nice to enjoy it while it's here. The clouds are always changing, so just letting it change and dissipate as a cloud will do. Enjoying that pleasure or good thing that came your way, but then letting it go when it's time to fade away. See yourself allowing that good experience that you had maybe in the recent past to exist and then to dissipate, not trying to hold on to it. Letting it come into your life and letting it go. And similarly, bring to mind a difficulty that you might have had recently, some painful experience or some criticism someone gave you or some loss that you had. See that also like a cloud floating through the sky. It stays for a while and then it breaks up and turns into rain or dissipates. So don't stick to that either. Feeling like you have to push it away or or change it. Just let it 
Let it be there as a cloud, knowing that it's going to also shift and, and flow away in its own time. So not fighting it. Staying in this center. Things flow in and they flow out. Both what is wished for and that that isn't wished for. We can make room for all of it and let all of it go. Our hearts are that big, that spacious. Connect with the freedom that's possible when we don't try to cling or try to push away. But we rest in this spacious, still place with the awareness of Mahagosananda that life is full of ups and downs. So now I invite you to visualize something else. Now you can see yourself as a wave on the ocean. You rise up out of the water and begin to move quickly. And there are also other waves around you. The other waves around you are moving more slowly. And you feel special because you can go faster than those other waves. But then a huge wave comes by, dwarfing you and passing you by, making you feel small and insignificant. But you and the slower waves and you and the faster, bigger waves are actually of the same nature. So let yourself go beneath the surface of the water and sink down and down and down. Now you're ready to rest in the embrace of the ocean and you can touch here the truth of your nature as water. Here, down at the bottom, there's no fast or slow, no big or small. There's just water. The same substance that makes up the waves that were slower than you and the wave that was bigger than you. But there really isn't you anymore because now you're just water. Let yourself enjoy being immense, vast, empty of a separate self, but full of everything, content to contain everything around you.
I cannot add more days to my life, but only more life to each day. I cannot add more days to my life, but only more life to each day. Lie die da 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 die da